Hi, and welcome to Lecture 17. In Lecture 17, we want to look at a specific kind of biological macromolecule called proteins. Now, the first thing to understand about proteins is that they serve a vast array of functions within the body. Here's just a couple. First, they can serve as catalysts, which catalysts are enzymes that help metabolic reactions take place. Second, they can act in defense, things such as antibodies. They can patrol the body and help to detect pathogens. They can also aid in transport. They can help to transport things around the body from place to place. They can contribute to structural support. These are called support proteins. They can, and they can do things such as be part of the cell membrane. They can cause movement. Proteins and things such as cilia or flagella will help move cells in the body. They can perform regulation. You can have cell membrane proteins that will regulate the passage of materials into or out of the cell. Lastly, they can help to provide storage as well. Now, proteins have a general structure. And the first thing to consider is that proteins are composed of one or more strands of monomers. Now, the term monomer is a general term where mono, the prefix mono, means one. And the idea is that the monomer is a base unit of something. And the monomers for proteins are amino acids. Now, there are 20 total amino acids in living organisms. And they are unique and at the same time they have a lot in common. One of the ideas about monomers is that they are very similar and as you hook monomers together you will get a polymer. Well amino acids are the same way. They have an amine group which is a type of functional group and a carboxylic acid group. And they are both covalently linked to the same carbon atom. This is later going to play a role in the ability to link amino acids together. Now that carbon is also covalently bonded to a hydrogen and various side chain structures. Now these side chain structures are what gives the amino acids its functional properties. It is often referred to as the R group and it will distinguish one amino acid from another. The amino acids are covalently linked by bonds called peptide bonds, and they are formed during a dehydration synthesis reaction. Now, if you look at the term dehydration synthesis, to dehydrate something is to pull water out, such as dehydrate the body. Synthesis simply means to take a couple pieces and make something new. In this case, the pieces are amino acids, and we are making something new with a protein. Now the dehydration synthesis reaction occurs between the amine group of one amino acid and the carboxylic group of another. And if you look, a hydrogen atom is lost from the amine group and OH is lost from the carboxylic acid and together HOH or H2O makes water. Now the N terminal end has the free amine group and the C terminal end has the free carboxyl group. There will be a figure showing each of these in just a minute. Here's the example of the amino acid. Here's our amine, that's NH2. Here's our carboxylic acid, that's carbon doubly bound to an oxygen and singly bound to an OH. And here's the R group. Now keep in mind R is just simply standing for something else here and this something else is what's going to determine the kind of amino acid that, that it is. Now this is the general structure of every amino acid. The only thing that changes is the R group itself. Here is the example in B of a dehydration synthesis reaction. Here we have the OH from the carboxylic acid and the H from the amine. They are combined, they are pulled out and combined to form water. 
and as these are pulled out the remaining electrons in this carbon and this nitrogen will be bound together to form a bond between the two. You can see this bond highlighted here in purple. All of these spots are peptide bonds and they were all formed the same way. They were all formed by dehydration synthesis. Now of this protein polymer we can see the N-terminal end with the amine group and the C-terminal end with a carboxylic acid. Now, in proteins, you can have strands of amino acids of various sizes. An oligopeptide is between 3 and 20 amino acids long. It's still forming a protein, but there's only 3 to 20 amino acids that make up this protein. A polypeptide is between 21 and 199 amino acids. Whereas a protein, which is the term most people are familiar with, actually means something specific. It is referring to a polymer of amino acids that is more than 200 amino acids long. Now proteins don't simply exist just as proteins. They can be also joined to other organic macromolecules in something that is termed conjugated molecules to have various functions in the body. One example is the glycoproteins and this is a protein that has a carbohydrate attached to it. The example is the glycoproteins on erythrocytes or the red blood cells help determine the blood type or ABO blood groups of individuals. Now the amino acids can be based on their R groups and these R groups can be broken down into several different kinds. The first one is the nonpolar amino acids. They contain R groups with hydrogen or hydrocarbons. In this context, nonpolar means they are hydrophobic. That means that they don't interact easily with water, that they will interact more easily with other nonpolar molecules. And the phrase like dissolve like applies here. Polars will help to interact with other polars and nonpolars will help to interact with other nonpolar compounds. And in fact, the nonpolar amino acids tend to group with the other nonpolar amino acids by hydrophobic interactions. The second kind is the polar amino acids, and these contain R groups with other elements, just not simply hydrogen, and they will form interactions with other polar amino acids and with water, and this interaction with water is very important because it helps to keep the proteins dissolved in water or in solution within the body. The third kind is charged amino acids. And these contain R groups with a negative or a positive charge. And the interesting part here is that they can form ionic bonds between charged amino acids, whether they are negative or positive. They are highly hydrophilic. These charged amino acids will therefore help to contribute to protein structure. We also have some amino acids with special functions. And these do specific things within the body. An example would be methionine, which is the first amino acid that is produced during protein synthesis. Another one would be cysteine, which are amino acids that can form disulfide covalent bonds. And these bonds again contribute to protein structure. It is simply a bond that forms between two sulfur atoms. Speaking of protein conformation, the conformation is an idea of shape of the protein. And you can think of this conformation as a three-dimensional structure. And this three-dimensional structure is made up of different levels of structure. And the first of that is the primary structure of the protein. And the idea of the primary structure is the linear sequence of amino acids. That is, in what order are the amino acids linked together. And this order, as you can see with these different color circles, 
will help determine the shape that it forms. Now this conformation is crucial for protein structure, with the first level being the primary level or the sequence of amino acids and how they're linked together. But there are levels of organization beyond the primary structure, and these arrangements are dependent on intramolecular attractions, that is, attractions between amino acids, the atoms of the amino acids. And it is obtained through folding with the help of specialized proteins or chaperone. One example would be the heat shock proteins, as proteins are said to be denatured or lose their shape within the body. Because of heat, the heat shock proteins, which are resistant to denaturing at high temperatures, will help to fold those proteins back into their original shape. These are an example of chaperone proteins. These intramolecular interactions are hydrophobic between nonpolar amino acids and these are the ones that are further from water. The hydrogen bonds between the polar R groups are those that have charges are between amine and carboxylic acid groups. Hydrogen bonds by itself is a very weak bond but taken together they can form a very powerful force of protein structure. You have ionic bonds between the negative and positive R groups and you can have disulfide bonds between the cysteine amino acids. These all contribute to the structure of the protein. Beyond the primary structure, we have the secondary level of protein conformation. And this is the idea where you will form the alpha helix, shown here, or the beta sheet. Now keep in mind that these are formed because of the sequence of amino acids within the protein. And if you would affect that primary sequence, it would in fact affect the secondary sequence as well. Third, we have the tertiary level of structure. And this is the final three-dimensional shape of the chain of amino acids. As you look at the picture, you can see the straight chain, which is the primary structure. Then you can see the pleated sheets and alpha helices. And the arrangement of those within the, polypepti the polypeptide chain, or how they relate to each other in three-dimensional shape, helps give you its tertiary level of structure. This is a globular protein. You can also see the same thing within a fibrous protein. Lastly, we have the quaternary structure of protein conformation. And this is the idea where we have more than one three-dimensional protein hooked together. And in this example, in this globular protein, there is four separate three-dimensional structures here. We have the two darker colored and the two lighter colored proteins. Now as they are joined together they will serve a different function than if they were separate. We can, all see, we can also see this within the fibrous proteins in which you have three different strands wound together and they will have a separate function bound together than they did by themselves. A perfect example would be hemoglobin. This is an example of hemoglobin with two alpha and two beta chains. When they are by themselves, they do not perform the same function as hemoglobin. But as they are joined together, we get the hemoglobin structure. Hemoglobin is found within your red blood cells and it helps to carry oxygen throughout your body. Now, some proteins have prosthetic groups, the example being the heme group in hemoglobin. The heme group contains iron, and it's the iron that bonds to the oxygen molecule itself. As I mentioned earlier, you can have denaturation as well, and that's a conformational change to a protein. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that a conformational change will affect the function of the protein. 
a protein's function is directly dependent on its conformation. So any change to that conformation will generally lead to protein not functioning correctly. It is usually irreversible and can occur during heating or changes in pH. The changes in heating or pH will break or weaken the intramolecular interactions that help give it its structure. Now when you consider pH changes on protein structure, you have to keep in mind that they are generally drastic, irreversible changes. They are changes that interfere with electrostatic interactions, as you see here, between specific functional groups and other intramolecular bonds. Looking at this example, we can see that here is the bond that we want to consider. And this bond is an ionic bond. So it's a bond between a positive hydrogen and a negative oxygen. Well, as you change the amount of H plus, or hydronium ion, within the solution that is next to the protein, as it mixes with the protein, that H plus will be added to that O negative, giving us the OH and breaking this bond. Now if you decrease pH and you decrease the amount of H plus that is sitting in solution out here, what happens is as this goes down, it will pull the H plus off of this amine group and it's this specific H plus and you can see it leaving and you are therefore breaking this bond as you remove that H plus.